Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, Data Art IT Nonstop uh, Conference. Uh, the topic we want to discuss today is uh, AI governance for enterprises. Uh, and what we wanted to do, and we thought it would be rather fitting, is to use Data Art as a case study. Data Art is both a vendor, a supplier of the technology, and at the same time, we're using this technology ourselves. In a way, it's a bit of a living up to the old uh, proverb of doctors being healthy and uh, healing themselves. Um, we're talking with Yuri Gubin, who is Data Art Chief Innovation Officer. Welcome, Yuri. Uh, if you could just give a couple of words about what we can expect today, and then we can crack on with the presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Dmitry. Absolutely. Um, so as you mentioned, DataArt is a user of the technology and the supplier. So I, among, what, among the many things that I'm doing, I'm leading our AI lab. And we think about DataArt as our own client. So we face very similar challenges as our enterprise clients. So in this presentation, I will go through some key points about the governance, uh, the challenges, the vision, and what we have done internally that helps us A, transform ourselves, and B, work better with our customers. Okay. Let's start then, but uh, I have to warn you, I'm not, I mean, I, I do have a degree in computer science, but that was a long time ago, and I was a very bad developer. Uh, I, I guess I'm now taking revenge on all the developers by asking them really awkward questions. So just be prepared. I'm going to be asking awkward questions. When we talk about our own AI governance and what we did to uh, transform or to start this journey, um, we need to mention the AI Ready program. So uh, with the changed perception of complexity in AI with ChatGPT and all the solutions and platforms emerging, it, uh, it is very clear nowadays that the industry is changing itself. Solutions are changing, and at the same time, the way developers work, it also is changing. Can I, can so, I, can I interrupt go as ahead. we talk, Yuri? So when you say industry is changing, which industry in particular you mean? Um, custom software development, everything around IT and services, and uh, industries that actually, uh, you see, it's not just one industry, it's across the board. Even industries that are not in the software development, but they're using technology, they're also changing. Which is the way describing how, pretty how, much every single industry in existence, because I'd be hard pressed to find anyone who is not using technology. But AI in yeah. itself is not actually a new thing. I mean, I majored in university in um, in artificial intelligence, and uh, that was a long time ago. So AI is, as a concept, is nothing new. Um, everyone says that generative AI really changed the playing field, but can you explain what exactly happened? Why is it so so changing, so life altering now? Yeah. Um... The perception of the complexity has changed, as I mentioned. What it means is that before you had to have a team of data scientists and everything in AI and machine learning, you had to invest heavily. There was a very high risk and there is a, a chance that it will never work because of the data issues, because of the quality of the model and because of the limiting functionality of these models. Um, yes, we talk about conventional AI use cases, the, the, the same clusterization, the same um, regression and statistical analysis. All of that was, um, it had to be consumed by other systems. It was not as user-friendly, and although the value was there when ChatGPT and, and um, the, when it was released and when it was available and when it became available to uh, the wider audience, everyone now sees the value of it by interacting with it. You can ask anything, it can generate you the response, and you can see how easily and quickly you can use it in different fields. From writing the source code, to creating articles, to analyzing large volumes of documents. And you can use it not only in the chat perspective, but you can cre think about many different aspects of how you can use uh, GPT and generative AI and um, it, it just changes, for example, the NLP 
it used to be a very important field, a very important pillar in AI and machine learning. And nowadays with GPT, with uh, all of it on the market, we talk about generative AI, not about NLP. The NLP problem pretty much has been solved. So this is what has changed. Okay. Okay. Interesting. But uh, one one thing which actually stands out um, is that we're talking about AI for enterprises. Uh, and again, um, I, I promised you awkward questions. So what is it? What is an enterprise for you? Why we're talking not just about AI governance, but AI governance for enterprises in particular? Yeah, it's a very good question. So the enterprise, it's an organization and there might be different definitions. I'm coming from my pragmatic perspective. It's a complex organization that is exposed to regulations in different countries. It has a, 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 it has revenue. It has a large number of employees. It has somewhat complex structure internally from the legal perspective, from the um, organizational development perspective. And it's a, a very complex living organism with lots of context dependencies and challenges that are specific to large scale organizations. So if we're talking, so can, if we're talking um, examples, then uh, Disney would be an enterprise. Um, yeah. I don't know. Kmart would be an enterprise. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they start to, 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 to using the same, my definition again, I, I mentioned that this is very pragmatic. They start, it, it fits the enterprises definition because we are a large organization and we have presence in many different countries around the world and we have internal departments and we have our clients and yeah, we have thousands of engineers that work every day on writing software. So yeah, we are in the enterprise from this perspective. Okay, good. So let's, uh, let's try and see what the governance is, um, for enterprises using data art as an example. Shall we ask yep. our artificial intelligence to go to the next slide? Thank you. Right. So when we talk about the uh, AI governance and what makes companies that uh, adopted AI successful, what makes it um, um, what create value to the company rather than be a distractor and, and waste of resources. So here are the keys to success that we learned and that we uh, discovered when working with our clients and um, advisors. One key thing here is there should be a roadmap that connects AI initiatives to business value. It's no longer pure R&D. It has to see uh, a use case. It should generate value. Uh, you need to well, have... If, Go if, ahead. If I, if I stop you there, so um, again, I've seen quite a lot of different technologies being tutored as the best thing since sliced bread, and then sometimes the best thing before sliced bread. Um, and, uh, I, I was, but at some point it was going mobile, then it was blockchain, then it was cloud, then it was something else. Uh, the reality, big data was sort of hype some years ago. Uh, in reality, what almost always happened, uh, is that it, it just proved to be yet another solution to all of the problems that were still existing. And nothing really new happened. Uh, when you're saying connecting AI initiatives to business value, um, what is what is the what is the priority here? Defining AI initiatives or defining what kind of value we're getting out of it? I think that to answer this, uh, think about what you you're doing in your AI program and how it will create value. Let me uh, well, elaborate on this. There's, there's, there's something I wanted to argue with, because from my point of view, if we're talking about business, uh, the first and most important task of any business owner, or any business uh, decision maker, is not actually thinking about how can I plug a particular initiative into my business. It's basically thinking, how can I make my business more profitable? How can I make it more efficient? Uh, how can I make it bigger? Uh, so from my point of view, all of the technologies that are currently being used on the markets, including generated AI, uh, in the 
first place, most importantly, should be viewed from the point of view, how can they actually bring business value? Can we, can we have a look at AI in particular from that and how it actually brings value to the business? Yeah. So think about, for example, um, uh, in our own processes, the, the success of our own project that we deliver to customers depend on their productivity, how quickly they can do certain things. And yes, one of the things that we're doing, we are exploring AI assistance, productivity tools, and we see, we try to measure what how they impact the productivity of our developers so they can work faster, that they can be more creative, that they don't make obvious mistakes and, and they have this assistance, a, a tool that guides them. It's not a silver bullet. Some people don't like it, some people like, but there is an evidence from practical experience that in certain areas, uh, yeah, it is a significant uh, you know, improvement when you work with a, a productivity tool. And it helps you move legacy systems to the new stack. It helps you create, uh, 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 like, you know, split the monolith in microservices, for example, by just, you are not doing this alone. You're not writing code on your own. You have a tool that allows you to do it quickly. We used to have similar tools before. Now the quality of them has changed and they just work faster. They're driven by generative AI and they can understand the context. So this is just one of the examples. So basically, if uh, if developers no longer have to spend significant amount of time on sort of mundane, mundane, menial tasks, uh, which could be very efficiently and very accurately performed by AI assistants, they actually can concentrate on something which cannot be done by AI uh, and so not be distracted by something else. So basically, yep. from the uh, point of view of data art as a business, what we're doing is we're using AI to make ourselves more efficient. You listen? Yep. And at the same time, um, think not only about developers. We, we have multiple departments here and there. The way how we work with our engineers, the HR, uh, recruitment, uh, um, how we approach the market, how we create marketing materials, we use AI to uh, save time, increase productivity, and allow people to be creative and spend their time on the most important parts and spend less time on less important. And by using generative AI, we can now connect siloed data and think about it as we have, a, a, maybe we have a system that has all the quantitative information about our developers with um, something that is in a form of feedback or documents, different kinds of materials and, and data here and there. We can connect it, all of it together to, to, to gain new insights about individuals, about projects, about accounts. So you were talking basically again about increasing efficiency, but from a slightly different angle where you analyze the uh, uh, the existing layout and find areas where you can. Isn't it basically playing to the worst fears that people uh, discuss uh, quite often that AI is not going to take over certain jobs, but actually would govern the way that people are performing the jobs that are left? Well, um, yes and no. Uh, really what I've observed in the last six months is that generative AI, instead of replacing people, actually creates new opportunities. And we didn't talk about prompt engineering as, as a speciality 12 months ago. Now it is a thing. We never talked about um, uh, RAG, retrieval augmented generation use cases before. Now we, we talk about it. And uh, again, some of the jobs, yeah, they will be covered by AI, but there will be new, uh, new roles that emerged that emerged just because we have generative AI, like with any other technology. And I also wanted to make one comment. I mentioned a couple of the uh, scenarios and things targeted at optimizing our own efficiency and operations. We work with clients. So if we do the same thing, but faster, it's just half of the equation. We also want to do new thing for our customers. 
and we want to be there where they want us to be. And because many customers, they are trying to approach their own transformation, their own journey with AI, with generative AI, it is in our interest to be prepared, to know the best practices, to know solutions, to have offerings, to help them get to the point where they want to be. So in, 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 in essence, what you're saying is uh, the major difference, uh, the, the, the key to making a difference on this journey is to actually understand the tools that you're going to be using. There's nothing, nothing new in this sentence, um, which it makes it, I think, even greater. Because if there was something new, we would be in trouble. But uh, in reality, that's that's what you're saying. Yeah, understand the technology, understand use cases, pitfalls, and challenges, and new issues that emerge just because this tool, this new technology, is here. How to handle it differently? For example, in um, in cybersecurity. Generative AI is both, and advancement in AI in general is both a threat and a tool, an opportunity to be more efficient and find new threats quickly. And at the same time, attackers can use the same AI to create new types of attacks. So again, technology, it's an opportunity, it's it's a risk. And as with any other tool in technology, it kind of we talk about the same questions about how to govern it, how to um, make it efficient, scalable, and so on and so forth. Okay. Okay. Let's go to the next slide then, probably. Thank mm -hmm. you. Sure. So uh, this is the vision that defines how we started um, this transformation uh, earlier this year. And AI is a mainstream and a new norm, meaning that every solution, every architecture in product, every project that data that we design, that we work on, considers AI as a first-class citizen. And some projects they they don't require AI right now. Some solutions they're they're not like there they're, there is no room for this at the moment. But when we look at the rate of and the pace of change, we understand that it should not be a surprise to us that the same technology, the same product that we were developing two years ago, now requires transformation, and there will be AI uh, driven uh, new features, new changes. And this is where we want to be as a company, that every engineer in the company, every person to, to a certain degree knows AI capabilities that are relevant to them. If we talk about developer, if we talk about an architect or penetration testing uh, engineer, uh, or we talk about even designer or uh, business analyst, every person should understand the impact of AI, its capability and how they can use it when they work with their clients. So we're again, uh, we're again going back to the fact that AI is a, is a tool that is becoming very widely used. Pretty much, uh, I think. Um, I mean, I, I read quite a lot of comparisons um, between AI and um, other technologies which emerged, and um, the most often uh, what I read or hear is uh, AI being compared with uh, with the cloud and how the cloud actually affects it, uh, the the business landscape. Um, I don't think um, it's a correct comparison, by the way, because I think uh, in a lot of ways AI is uh, AI's effect is a lot more profound than the one that we um, experienced with the cloud. I think it actually can be compared most likely with uh, the change that computers, personal computers, brought or or the internet. Yes, um, it is very accessible now. Yeah, which is which is actually making. The, all those uh, conspiracy theories and, you know, the uh, AI is taking over the world. Uh, quite interesting to read. It's all been predicted by science fiction writers. We don't have to invent anything else. There's okay. A... Um, good. Let's, let's, let's go to the next one. Yeah. Here is, um, so w it, to have a vision, it's just first step. We, we try to unpack it to convert it into some roadmap, tangible steps in our own journey, in our own transformation. So here you can see uh, an example of what we use. There are multiple stages, three, crawl, walk, and run. You, you cannot boil the ocean. You need to approach every challenge in a certain way. And we do have cer uh, certain pillars. It's outreach, it's technical skills, it's technolo technology domain expertise, and subject matter expertise. And each and every pillar here 
um, has its own objectives, goals, milestones. We talk about developing both uh, technical skills that, as I mentioned, every engineer, in, every person in the company understands certain components and capabilities of AI. But at the same time, we are going deep into AI itself by doing prototypes, by doing research, who's the, by partnering who's the with target, companies. Who is the target audience of this particular uh, of this particular program? So if we're talking about data, adopting AI as one of the major tools, and then data as a, as a case study, as an enterprise example, um, who is the target audience here? Because it talks a lot about um, technology and technical skills and uh, um, everything else in between. From my point of view, again, for the business, technology understanding is important, but it's not the only thing you need to understand. So who is the target audience of this particular example? Of, um, of this program, so we talk about our own labs, our own verticals, um, uh, our own practices, and it's our um, alliances, our partnerships with uh, third parties, with hyperscalers and with AI leaders. So I'm not using too many details here when, for example, we investigate and we invest into creation of prototypes for industry-specific use cases. It goes in one of the uh, cells in subject matter expertise development. It's just one of the things that we're investing in. So we, we talk about um, engineers, architects, and subject matter experts that work with clients. Which is interesting because um, it's, it's kind of, again, I, I promised you lots of awkward questions and then uh, hopefully going to deliver on that. But w what I think uh, is missing from, from this particular plan is uh, how the business development is going to be uh, looking at, how the corporate governance is going to be involved. Because if we're talking about data art as a company, data art as a company doesn't consist of only developers. It actually has uh, a significant proportion of people who have no technology background and even even more, their jobs are not actually directly related with technology. So if you take salespeople, for example, um, we tend to talk about technology, but in reality, our main skill is ability to talk to people. Uh, and then without without salespeople data art would not be able to to exist because we bring in clients so how do people who are not technical can benefit from this yep so we can probably go to the next slide at this point because here we exactly talk about different segments so we started by looking at our own engineers and architects and people who work with clients but as a company as you mentioned there are different groups that are not even technical and they they don't write code so you you say we you realize say it with 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 such venom. You know, we don't write codes <laughs> like that. Shouldn't they exist in an IT company? <laughs> they don't write. <laughs> but truth be said, we have a very strong engineering culture. So and and you yourself, you did writing code in the past. So you you can understand so the language and the context. Well. The... <laughs> yeah. So having a vision is just first step. Having the roadmap is the second. What now? So we started um, actually discovering different use cases and the opportunities within the company where we can use AI, what value it can deliver, what these are use cases that that make sense. So we um, we started talking to different departments within the company, sales, marketing, operations, support, uh, our own resources and recruitment and HR. We discovered more than 50 use cases where it was a clear fit that yes, Gen AI can do something good here. We talk about creating a knowledge base for sales. So um, business development professionals can find resources quickly, faster, get answers quickly. Did we do this or that in the past? And now you can use chat to get the answer. Um, what about case studies and references or partnership work? Again, uh, there is one thing that can help you with this and, and by means of working with a with a um, gen ai assisted solution you can find answers to that um, analysis of our own uh, engineers and accounts and so we've again we've we we collected 
more than 50 different use cases across different departments. What, what's the a lot of it, what's, what's uh -huh. the what's the least technical use case that you can give us an, give us an example? Oh, it's a very good question. Probably is um, say an interview like we have right now. Uh, when we do analysis of account management work of account portfolios, and when we try to understand th the bigger picture, we can think about a number of interviews between different people. But at the same time, we want to get some key data points, signals from these interviews. Sometimes it's a one hour long conversation. And to post process that to understand, you, you know, to, to get some insights from it, you need to summarize it. You need to convert voice into text, text into summary. You need to extract data points and you need to get something that you can then, you know, analyze across the board using that particular single it, it, it or could be It could be very interesting to see what kind of summary is going to come up from our account. So it's probably going to be talked yeah. about AI a lot. A lot. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that's true. So yeah, this is one of the, the I think, the least technical. Um, sometimes it can go very deep into our policies and, you know, with the chatbot that uh, that I, I will be describing in a, in a moment. Uh, it's a knowledge base. It's, it's an L1 support to our employees. To what degree it's technical, but yeah, you, you work with, with, with a chatbot. It is integrated in our corporate ecosystem. And at the same time, you can ask non-technical questions about when is the next holiday? If we, if we use, again, if we use data art as an example of an enterprise, uh, I mean, the, oversimplifying, but in, in a way, your definition of enterprises is big and bureaucratic. Uh, and, uh, I mean, the, data art is, is not the biggest company and not the most bureaucratic, but we're certainly getting there. Uh, and uh, one of the ways that you can look at optimizing um, your operations is look at where the bottlenecks are, which tasks are taking the longest. Uh, did you do any kind of analysis um, in, in that regard on the use cases? Yeah, we did this to prioritize them. So among the 50 use cases, we cannot start 50 at once. Uh, uh, there should be a roadmap and priority. Yeah, so we analyzed what if we do it and it works, what is the reward for this? We save time or we get new perspective, we get new data, new insights from this. What is the value of this particular use case? And how it fits the bigger picture because we are our business in, is not in the research itself. We are not creating new model just um, as a mathematical abstraction or, or a very nice experiment. What will it make? What kind of value it creates to the company? How we can use it when we work with our clients? For example, our own AI platform, we now use it as, as a preference, as a blueprint when we talk to our customers. Our accelerators, we enhance them with generative AI, and now we can do projects faster. So, and we deliver capabilities that are not on the market. Cool. Excellent. Shall we ask for the next slides? Yeah. Yay. All right. All right. So you see, this is the journey, um, the vision, the, ro the roadmap, the definition of like use cases and where we can use AI in the company. And now, all right, how do we start? doing it and um, yes many things start with a POC and sometimes you do a first step but when we talk about an enterprise it has to be secure it has to be regulated and it has to be transparent it has to has the right access control and, uh, and user management control it, it needs to be scalable and accessible across the board because there are so many different use cases and you cannot repeat the same thing over and over and over you need to have a platform and the platform here is, is a solution, yes, to enable Gen AI and ML capabilities, but it's not only in the tech field and landscape. We also talk about compliance, legal, how we manage risk, how we approach conversations about AI, how we prioritize things, and how we structure our teams within the lab and within the company 
so we can develop these use cases faster. So this platform is a concept that has both technical components and organizational, non-technical component. It's a solution that has architecture for both. From from, from your point of view, uh, where is the starting point? Is is it uh, organizational structure or is it um, techno technological platform? So, um, say several years ago, it would be purely technical. Nowadays, I would start with with the people and with the org structure. In our case at Datart, we do have AI committee. We talk about AI in our board. We have ambassadors in all of our departments that understand it. We have a cross-functional team that is concerned about development of this platform and what are the use cases and, and risks. And we we started conversations with compliance and infosec early on because we all understand the impact of this. So I would say that start with people and with org structure first, and then proceed carefully proceed with the technology implementation. Because again, remember the perception has changed and it is not as complex now. You don't need to develop your own foundational model anymore. In some cases, you just need to integrate parts here and there and, 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 and it works. But because it is so easy, uh, some people, they, they stop thinking about the same data privacy, security and compliance. And what about this and that? Ask these questions early and then proceed with the technical implementation. So if, 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 we, if we're talking about this, what would you identify as the major potential risk areas? I mean, you, you mentioned compliance at least three times. I, 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 I yeah. agree completely because it's very easy to forget uh, about data, um, data privacy, and um, just share data with, uh, with with the with the engine without thinking where exactly it goes. Uh, what else can you uh, can you identify? Yeah, so um, there are several risks. One is yes, it's about costs. You need to control it because, as with any cloud based or, or you know the modern technology, it can be very powerful and very expensive. You need to have a clear vision about on on the burn down rates, uh, the, the the model how you you project costs associated with this solution. The other thing is outside of data privacy and security and compliance as you mentioned, there is one thing that is very specific to Gen AI is how you tackle hallucinations and ethical concerns. When people work with a chat you tackle what? Hallucinations. Yeah, it's a real thing. It's a um, in the Gen AI field, it's a, it's a concept that is very well known. Is when uh, uh, the, the Gen AI the model will produce you sentences with a very high confidence. The model can tell you that two plus two is five, or I'm simplifying things, but yeah, it can mix in things that don't exist and be very confident about them. Do androids dream of electric sheep? Got it. Uh, yeah, something like this. And the ethical concerns, it, it is much more difficult because uh, every person has its own core values. And as a company, as an enterprise, there are certain corporate values and, and beliefs and what we think is the right way, our own position on questions and topics. It's about policy. It's about uh, geopolitical questions and issues. It's about um, racial questions. When people start working with Gen AI, the first thing many people do, they start exploring how, huh, what do you tell me about this or that? And you, we, we've seen early days in uh, of our prototypes, we've seen how, yeah, the model can, the responses can be not in line with our values. It can, because the model was trained years ago because uh, we didn't explain our own position on this or that. And that's why it's another major risk. And you need to think about it because when you're dealing with an enterprise ecosystem, you have thousands of people in different countries and everyone there, there is a third rail always like even friends can discuss something and find that, yeah, they have difference of opinion on this or that. And it, the model has to be very like not the model doesn't like you know engineers who are working on the use case and the platform need to spend time in prompt engineering need to spend time in architecting 
uh, getting the feedback or controlling the responses. So they are in line. How would with you How would you tackle something like this? I mean, um, okay, you probably can train the models on certain subsets of data, but then you're kind of defeating the purpose of it having access to as many data points as uh, as possibly uh, as possible. Uh, but also, but that's kind of something that I can wrap my head around. How would you tackle hallucinations? I've been apart from hiring a psychologist to treat for the AI. Yeah, so um, you start elaborating the request response, the prompt and the response generation. You, you uh, By means of prompt engineering, you define the context, you define the thinking process and decision-making process. So the model will act as a certain person will have certain guardrails when it generates responses. And yeah, prompt engineering is quite an extensive field now. Um, this is just one thing. Y you start by, by, by exploring how you actually work with the model, giving the request from the, custom, from the user. Then um, you can implement a feedback loop and run the response through another model, through another prompt uh, uh, engineer, you know, sentence and, and chain. So you can make an assessment of whether the factual information there is correct. You can um, start challenging the response, whether it has any offensive statements or whether it tackles the, the question in the right way from ethical and hallucination standpoint. And you can even make another loop that is less on Gen AI side and more on practical side, extract key data points from the response and literally run it against something that you can quantify, you can trust, you can trace. And if it works, then it goes to the customer. If it doesn't work, it go it, it is being flagged and compliance and engineers will review what is happening here. So it's a combination of both how you approach the question, how you start working with the Gen AI with, with the model, and it's how you post process the response itself. You training uh, you're basically educating you you're, you're training the uh, the AI to understand the difference between false and uh, true. To a certain degree, yes, but training is, um, it has thousands of definitions. And in this particular case, training of a new model is very expensive and complex thing. I don't think that we personally, like, you know, that's a company in this field, like we don't want to compete with those who create these foundational models, but we need to know what we need to do on the platform level to control the quality of responses. And we need to train something that consumes, that works, that touches the model. That training, yeah, okay. we do it. We do it. Okay. Okay. Good stuff. Here's yep. The next so, one. Um, using that platform, what we've done, um, and I can be very brief on, on these case studies. So we developed um, a new feature in one of our accelerators, which we found is is very useful. So if you remember um, the problem of OCR, you have thousands of PDFs and you want to get data from these PDFs, um, there are solutions on the market. Yes, some of them require manual mapping. Some of them require uh, a person to actually select segments and explain that, yeah, from this segment, extract this value. And from this table, extract this structure. We developed our own accelerator that uh, ha is multimodal and you can throw in documents in different formats and it will get the data from these documents without any manual mapping at all. And it can uh, assign uh, labels, it can um, uh, create subsets and classes of data that were, that were extracted and it works with different languages and everything. And, and then we realized, all right, we have this accelerator, now what? So you have the raw data of the document. Can we make another step forward and actually, instead of getting the raw data, classify the document or extract summary of the document or uh, derive insights from the doc from this the same PDF? And sometimes these documents, it can be a financial, it can be a proxy statement, it can be something like you know, 200 pages long and you need to just get three key insights from this document. So we created the pipeline that feeds the data from the OCR, from the DeepML um, accelerator into the model. And now um, the, the full chain between having a source document, 
uh, extracting the data from it, classifying, labeling, and then feeding it to a model and getting insights back is just drag and drop file into your browser. Boom, you have your insights on the right side. So we've developed that and we realized that, yeah, it can be quite useful because um, every second enterprise has something similar as a challenge in their roadmap and people are trying to, f- to tackle this problem. Yeah, we developed this with Gen AI in our yeah. platform. I think uh, an interesting um, an interesting uh, implication of what you're talking about is that actually a lot of the things that um, AI can help with uh, actually are not even on the roadmaps of a lot of companies simply because they were always considered as something that is just done that way. So things like uh, if uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fantasizing a little bit, but for example, if we need to optimize um, the process of analyzing legal documents that come our way, we usually do that manually, and there's a there's a person involved who reads the document and then deems it whether it's okay to sign or not. In reality, if we're fairly confident that um, AI can do that for us. It's an area where we can gain quite a lot of uh, efficiency, but we never actually put it on our radar because it was always done that way. So I think um, that that's actually a very interesting case study because what it shows is you need you really need to start from analyzing the bottlenecks, uh, not not the other way around. Sort of find the, here's a solution. Let's find the problem where it fits. Uh, let's let's look at how we work and analyze where we can actually. Uh, where we are spending a lot of time and maybe we can apply something here which would save us uh, some of that time. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Another comment that I can uh, make, not about the case study, but about the the thing that you explained. Um, Sometimes we think about AI as, as a solution to find the right something. However, uh, what we find in practice is that AI and Gen AI solutions they they allow you to fail faster. So if if it doesn't work, if the document you, you know if say with the same legal example, if there is something in the contract that is a red flag to us, with AI you can find it faster. If all of the AI capabilities that we have will tell you that this is a good contract, perhaps a person will still read it. But that person will will know that there are no red flags, and you don't need to waste time because if there are if there were any red flags, you would have known about them. With a, with a, with, a, with a bit of a caveat, uh, no obvious red flags. No obvious red flags. Because yes. my experience with uh, legalese and um, you know sort of legal profession in general is that uh, there are a lot of things which are only becoming red flags in context. That's one of the things that generative AI is actually quite good at. If you establish the context correctly, then you do get the right answers, but you need to keep that in mind fairly often, that certain things only can be important in a particular context. Yeah. Great. Yep. Um, um, shall we go yeah, to the next? There is another one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I yeah. can briefly touch base on this one. So this is the chatbot that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, what we've done, we've collected um, all the resources that we have, our knowledge base, um, our policies, and sometimes when you when you work in a company like Datart, like we have offices in twenty countries around the world or thirty, um, I I have a question like, when is the next holiday in that particular country? Because I don't know, and I need to know about this when I, I'm planning a, a, a new release in my project. Or uh, what about, like, how can I work um, from my own laptop? Or uh, what do I do about my vacation, for example? How do I plan it? What do, how do I request my vacation? And instead of searching and, and you know, trying to get that info uh, in the policies and the knowledge base and scanning through articles, I can ask this question and the chatbot will give me an answer and will give me a source link to the document where it is explained. And we can handle 60, 70% of L1 requests. Of course, here 
we have room to actually uh, do the magic with ethical concerns and hallucinations and accuracy of responses. So the model does not mislead the person. And But at the same time, yeah, um, we see the value that I can get answers quickly and I don't need to bother my colleagues or support team because I already have the answer. So we're, we're talking here again about finding something that um, is costing us quite a lot of time and resources and seeing whether we can actually optimize that, automate that, so it's not costing us that much. Okay. Next. And uh, on yeah, on the next, here is, uh, I just explained the two case studies that this is pretty much done and we are improving it. There is a lot that is in progress right now. I mentioned the productivity tools rollout. It, it is happening. Uh, we started experiments with our accounts and clients. We're going through extensive education program with our own engineers. And we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of people going through training and getting access to uh, productivity tools. Now, um, uh, the the training of all all the labs and upskilling of the company this is happening this is actively um, developing story so uh, this cross pollination is happening we are organize uh, panel discussions we organize um, technical sessions and meetings um, again we are developing use cases for the same sales and HR and account management here and there um, and we outside of data because you, you see. We, we have our internal and we have our external. External is our clients. This is the, the core. We're a customer-centric company. So we, we've we developed more than 40 different projects already, prototypes and production projects for our clients. And yeah, our experience, how we work with AI internally, we learn a lot of things, what to do, what not to do. And we come to our clients with this perspective in mind. <laughs> so again... Right, we, I think that was it. Uh -huh. We're approaching this from an angle of uh, what's what's the value that the token bring. Yeah, and um, what are the risks? What to do? What not to do? Because clients, when they come to data, they expect us to have this knowledge and expertise and history, and you know that we know twenty five different issues with this particular solution because we've done a number of them. And, and yes, we've done it. We know that your customers think about five things. There are 20 that customers don't think about. And we help our customers to, to learn about them, to educate people, to make decisions. Um, yeah, this is, I think, how Gen AI um, did this, this whole journey helps us create more value. Okay. I think we're almost at the end, and I'm a little bit conscious of the time. Um, we are at the end. Thank you, friendly AI. Um, I think, um, thank you, Yuri. I think that was that was really interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly going to be looking for hallucinations uh, next time I'm talking to ChatGPT. Just one last question for you. Uh, you do you use ChatGPT or something similar yourself? So um, when, uh, when it just emerged, yes, of course, uh, from the curiosity perspective, I was asking various different questions. Sometimes just to understand the limitations of capa of this capability. Sometimes, yeah, just to get some insights. Because when you start working and you have just blank screen, it's difficult to... Because you've done this in the past so many times, you cannot copy-paste. So, some inspiration. Do you, but, actually, do you actually say hello and thank you to the AI? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> So um, I do, and I do it on purpose. Uh, so Yuri, when the machines rise and the humanity oh, yeah. <laughs> you're exterminated, I hope that will count in my favor. <laughs> yeah, um, this is a very good comment. I should perhaps start doing this too. Yeah, no, that's, that's a very good idea. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Absolutely.